MPs, however, on the Finance Committee here in Ottawa have begun their probe into the We Charity controversy. Witnesses involved in that government contract are appearing, taking questions about why a charity with links to the Trudeau family was chosen for the $19 million agreement. Today's first witness, Youth Minister Bardish Chagger, who is responsible for the program. Let's take a look at some of that testimony. I was working with the public service. The professional, nonpartisan public service anyone? made a recommendation. I accepted it. So you did not discuss this with anyone in the prime minister's office prior to introducing it to cabinet? I did not have conversations with the prime minister's office. You brought it forward for discussion. Were you aware of the family links between the Trudeau family and we and the Morneau family and we? My focus was really on making sure that there was an additional support for young Canadians, for students. That's not the question. And that's the question, why it was aware? part of the suite of programs that we put forward. You failed. You were not aware of their fi the family links and you brought this? This is astounding. We now have a serious scandal and it happened on your watch. At $5,000 maximum for, per position brings us to $100 million. Where does the the other eight hundred million dollars go? I actually reject the explanation of the member. Obviously, the member is not listening to what I am saying. To hear more, we have reached Minister Chagger. She's joining us from her office in Ottawa. Hi, Minister. Great to have you back on the program. Good to see you, Bashi. I want to start off actually with a question based on the testimony that directly followed you from Rachel Wernick. That is the individual, the bureaucrat you identified as. Uh, providing to you the recommendation that, that the WE charity was best placed to administer uh, the student program. And I should explain to our viewers, the program is basically compensating students for volunteering and helping in the fight against COVID-19 based on the number of hours uh, that they volunteer. And the, it, the announcement itself came with a host of other measures through the Prime Minister, I think back on April uh, 22nd. What Ms. Wernick said was that the WE charity had already provided to several officials and ministers, and she named you as one of them, a proposal related to social entrepreneurship for youth and indicated it could be adapted as needed. Did the WE charity reach out to the government first with a proposal that resembled in some way the program that your government ended up announcing? So I would say, Vashi, that we work with numerous organizations. As a minister of youth, I work with many youth organizations from coast to coast to coast. Receiving unsolicited proposals is not something that is new. So we charity, uh, the we organization provided an unsolicited proposal. Their proposal um, is not the proposal that we put forward. Um, obviously, the public service is able to collect that information and then understand the capacity of organizations, the reach that they have, and then consider organizations to work with. In this case, for the Canada Student Service Grant, uh, we knew that we wanted to collect stu connect students who are um, providing you know, service from their communities, volunteer opportunities to like strengthen and develop their skills as well as heal communities. But we also knew that not-for-profits had an increased demand for their services and needed volunteers because of the COVID-19 context. We partnered them up through the CSSG and gave that project over to the public service. The public service took the project and then I have confidence, did their due diligence, made a recommendation and the recommendation they provided me was to have We Charity deliver the program and I accepted their recommendation. The timeline though that Ms. Wernick presented today I think is of real interest uh, to Canadians who, who are watching this story. She said that initially the when we submitted this proposal she then this happened at some point before april 22nd i don't have the exact date because i had to stop listening at, at 4 50. Uh, she then said that she contacted we on april 19th to avail herself of the expertise that could be provided and then the proposal that your government put forward was on the 22nd when at the heart of the questions initially after this announcement is the idea that it looked like, and I know that you oppose this idea, but that it looked like the government handed to an organization the Prime Minister has ties to a contract worth a lot of money, doesn't that timeline raise a few red flags? 
So today I was able to appear at Finance Committee. The members of all parties passed a motion um, to really get to some answers for, that Canadians and members are looking for. I made myself available to provide those answers. I even dug into the contribution agreement and what was negotiated between uh, the public service and We Charity, and I was able to share some of the parameters around that contribution agreement. And even though it did not come to that s the spot, uh, we knew we know, and I've been able to share that a maximum of forty three point five million dollars could have gone to We Charity. We Charity is no longer delivering that program. The amount allocated for the program was nine hundred and twelve million dollars. Majority of that money, and I'm talking about a vast majority of that money, was to provide grants to students, recognizing that. All Canadians have been impacted by COVID-19, disproportionately impacting certain communities, and youth are no exception. Students have a huge burden when it comes to their post-secondary education costs, and we were trying, we as government, have been trying to provide supports necessary during this pandemic to ensure that we are there to support each other, as well as to ensure that um, programs and services work. But we need to be really maximizing the potential of young people, students. They have skills that they want to develop, and they actually are part of helping to heal communities. And not-for-profits also are providing valuable work and expertise, looking for a hand up. So we partnered them up, and the CSSG was just another program as part of a suite of programs. Vashi, I think it's also important to recognize that we know that the process was not perfect, and we will continue to strive to do better. And that's why the Prime Minister came out and recognized that he should have recused himself from this decision. He has apologized. My focus remains on ensuring that youth have a full voice at the Cabinet table and that we are delivering for students as well as not-for-profits in this Minister, case. Minister, with respect, the question that I asked you actually predates even the Prime Minister's involvement or the period which he references when he apologizes for his recusal. I'm asking you if it would look suspect, doesn't it look suspect, that we was involved in talking to the bureaucrat who ended up designing the program prior to the Prime Minister even announcing that program vis-a-vis -a, -vis a proposal they had already sent and a conversation that they had. It looks like we was involved with this program that you ultimately decided to award to them well before it was even announced. And as part of the witnesses that the committee, the finance committee has asked to appear, Ms. Warnick is one of them. And as you know, she is currently testifying and providing those answers. What I have shared publicly and what is being noted within the testimony is that I was given a recommendation that We Charity is the best organization, the only organization that can deliver this program in the timeline needed. And yes, there was a lot of scrutiny. Yes, there was a lot of questions and a lot of back and forth. And ultimately, I did accept that recommendation that came from the public service. Ms. Warnick is able to explain as to the steps that took place and what her thought processes were. I know that the public service works really hard. I have confidence that they did their due diligence. They are nonpartisan, a professional public service. Everyone has been working around the clock to deliver for Canadians. And that's where I also have acknowledged that the process was not perfect. We will continue to strive to do better. Our focus remains on delivering for Canadians. Did the public service put forth to you more than one option? I take your point that they said this is the best option. Did you ask, are there other options and, and what's your evaluation on them? And as I shared at uh, Finance Committee, yes, I did ask a lot of questions. Many questions and a lot of back and forth has taken place. And I know that the public service, I have confidence that they did their due diligence. And if that was the recommendation they were coming forward with, uh, ultimately, after the scrutiny that my team and many others provided, we accepted their recommendation. Did they provide you with alternative recommendations or just this one? As I shared at Finance Committee, I was provided a recommendation stating that We Charity was the only organization that could provide this program with a magnitude and scale uh, that was expected in the timeline needed. The pr initial proposal that we sent the government, Ms. Warnick said that you were among the ministers who received that proposal. Did you ever uh, direct the public service to consider it? Did you uh, say that it should weigh into their decision making? Did you have any communication with the public service about that initial proposal? 
So I speak with youth organizations all the time. I've spoken to hundreds of organizations, youth organizations since taking this role. Anytime I am given an unsolicited proposal, I always direct them to officials so that officials can do their due diligence and look at ways that we can um, see what works. We are a government that works with Canadians. I keep an open door just because we know that Canadians are always part of the solution. And the pandemic especially, we have recognized that and we appreciate that Canadians have stepped up and we are all in this together. So anytime I am given um, an unsolicited proposal, I usually direct it to officials. In this case, that was no different. I directed it to officials so that they could look at the opportunities and abilities and if it's something that we should consider we would look to the public service to make recommendations. Did you or anyone in your office discuss that initial proposal with anyone in the Prime Minister's office? I did not have conversations on that proposal. I know that there was multiple conversations with multiple ministers. Ms. Wernick has testified to that as well. Um, Organizations often provide unsolicited proposals. Um, they want to be part of the solution and when they have ideas, our government listens to those ideas. We want to hear from Canadians, we want to hear from organizations and we welcome those opportunities and they're always considered on their merit. Did anyone in your office though speak with anyone in the Prime Minister's office about the initial proposal from the WE charity? The reason I'm asking, Minister, is because the way it looks with WE designing a program initially, then adapting it to meet an announcement that came after the initial proposal, is like they were involved right from the start in crafting a program that was eventually awarded to them. So I'm just trying to clear up for our viewers, were officials in your office talking to the Prime Minister's office about that initial proposal prior to the announcement of this program? So, Bashi, I would say that uh, Finance Committee asked for myself to, to come and testify. There was others that they have asked, and that's why the Public Service is present, um, providing their testimony, providing this information, so that members as well as Canadians can receive those answers. When it comes to that proposal, I did not have conversations with the Prime Minister's office. So, so you won't answer whether anyone in your office did? I just want to make sure I, I'm clear on that. Well, I am here and I will provide all the information that I have. I will tell you when it comes to the Canada Student Service Grant, what the vision was and why we went ahead the way we did. I will tell you that we had really tough conversations. I will share that my team had conversations with many different teams and offices because it is a substantial um, amount that was allocated to this program. So yes, my team would have spoken to many different offices to ensure that the program was both successful and deliverable because we wanted to ensure that our vision was one that would be able to work. Uh, for the very people that we were trying to serve. When it comes to the unsolicited proposal that you're referring to, that was not part of the programs and services. We were looking at part of the COVID-19 response, not at that time. And so therefore, it's just not a question that I can offer you information on because I, I don't have that information. Okay, you mentioned, Minister, just before I let you go, the cost of the program. And that is one thing that stuck out during your testimony. I just wanted to make sure I understand because I'm not great at math, but I've been, but I've been doing the math. And $912 million was allocated minus whatever ended up going to WE, which was a maximum, I think you said, of $43.5 million. You expected 20,000 students with a, an expect, expect, a potential expectation of, I think, doubling that, let's say, uh, with a second cohort. If you do all that up, it's about $200 million plus whatever went to WE. Why was $900 million allocated? So it's a matter of whether we could scale the program. So these are unprecedented and challenging times. And we were looking to, we as a government, were looking to put out a program that could help as many students and as many not-for-profits as possible. And that's why the initial cohort uh, we Charities was given $19.5 million. Of that $19.5 million, $5 million was directly for not-for-profits to be able to make sure the supports and the creation of um, service opportunities. An additional $10.5 million was given for a supplemental cohort because after the announcement was made, we heard from many local not-for-profits wanting to participate. And if the program had gone as anticipated, and unfortunately it did not, and we were, 
we recognize that the program did not uh, go the way we wanted to go and that the process was not perfect. There would have been an additional $13.53 million that right. would have been awarded for the second cohort. Yeah, no, I'm, so I'm yeah, not, right. I get that. It's a total of $43.5 million yeah. out of an allocated $912 million. Um, for the, and that's why the vast majority would be for grants. You have to also remember that we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're moving really quickly. Governments never had to move at this pace. And if the program had come out when it did, we probably would have been able to have more of an uptake. More students would have been able to maximize uh, up to the $5,000 grant. And that's why we are back uh, working around the clock to look at how we can deliver this program as an additional support for not only students, but also not for profit. So you thought there could be up to, let's say, 100,000 students. Is that accurate? We, and that's why there was opportunity. Students and Canadians are volunteering. They're rolling up their sleeves. We recognize that Canadians are hurting, and our government has committed to being there for Canadians during this very unprecedented and challenging time. We're working with all levels of government. Everyone has the same goal. We want to ensure that Canada fights COVID-19, and that's why all of us working together will ensure it. And that's where we've been innovative and creative in the programs that we're putting out. And we've tried to put them out as fast as possible to ensure that Canadians have the money they need so that they can be healthy and safe and that we can actually you know, flatten the curve. And as a country, I would say that we've done really well, um, but we can always strive to do better and our government remains committed to do so. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Minister Chagger, for your time this evening. Again, really appreciate it. Thanks, Vashi. Today, MPs on the Finance Committee have been grilling senior bureaucrats about the decision to award that charity a government contract with links to the Trudeau family. The charity did, rather. Trudeau, the Prime Minister, has since apologized and says he should have recused himself from discussions around that decision. Today, another apology, this one from Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland. Have a listen. I think all of us, everyone in our government, everyone in the Cabinet, bears responsibility for this situation. And I'd like to say, speaking for myself, that I accept that responsibility and I very much regret what has happened. And I'd like to say to Canadians, I'm really sorry. I would like to add, to be very clear, the Prime Minister has my complete confidence. Uh, it is a privilege for me to serve in his cabinet and to serve Canadians. So that statement was made in response to a question hours ago when the Prime Minister was actually announcing, along with Minister Freeland, uh, a package with the provinces for $19 billion in funding. Since then, uh, the Finance Committee convened. And starting at 3 o'clock, the Youth Minister, Minister Bartosz Chegger, who we had on the show just a bit earlier, testified. And then uh, someone named Rachel Warnick, who is uh, a senior-level bureaucrat who was tasked with designing and coming up with uh, much, of the, much of the details around this program. And she said, a couple very interesting things that I do want to put to the power panel, and that's who joins us right now. David Hurley is a partner in the Gandalf Group and host of the Hurley Burley podcast. Of course, Jenny Byrne, a frequent guest on that podcast, is a former top staffer to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Ontario Premier Doug Ford. She's now a principal at Jenny Byrne and Associates. They're both, I think, in Toronto. And Emily Nicolas is a columnist with Le Devoir and co-founder of Quebec Inclusive. She joins us from Montreal. Hi, all three of you. Great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Hi, good to see you. So I'm going to start off with, uh, so I actually thought Minister Chegger's testimony was what maybe we would have expected. Uh, she continued to talk about uh, the fact, and the, and the public service said too, that they put forth, David, the suggestion that we was best suited to administer this program. What came after, though, from uh, Ms. Warnick was interesting in that we had been in communication, had sent an initial proposal well before the government made its announcement. And in fact, she had talked to we a couple of days days before the Prime Minister got up there as well. Do you see that as problematic? Well, the government has drawn a line in the sand, and, and the apologies drew this line in the sand, that their mistake was in not recusing themselves from a decision on a program that had been brought to them by officials. Um, and so that's what they've apologized for, and that's the mistake that they've admitted. The opposition is going very, very hard to establish a different fact, a different fact base, and that is that the idea came from the political level of the government to the officials, rather than the other way around. In which case, if that's true, then recusal is kind of a ridiculous 
idea. I agree with you with what you're implying that Ms. Wernick did not uh, probably make that case as solidly as the government would like to have made it. I don't think the case collapsed, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly there's some blank space that she left that somebody needs to write in uh, in order to figure out what really happened here. Yeah, there's, there's still a lot of questions, I guess, about, uh, Jenny, what the role of WE was in the lead up to the crafting of this program. Because I think the, the, the government's argument, as David points out, really rests on this idea that the public service did put it forth. And uh, the public service says, yes, that's true. We, we do think WE is the only organization that could administer this program. But then they also told us, as I said, that we was kind of involved in, at least in informing their uh, views of how the project should take shape. Exactly. I, I have to say I was wrong. I thought that at the start that this was a uh, Trudeau government proposal to help we, but what it turns out to be, it, it was a we proposal to help we. Uh, what we found out today uh, uh, with, with Rachel Wernick's uh, testimony is that at the Finance Committee is that uh, we somehow got a proposal to the government, unknown who they got it to, because um, she would not say, on April the 16th. Somehow it got into her hands as this would be the preferred provider for this Canada student grant that we're going to be announcing. She calls we on April the 19th, uh, and we then resubmits an adapted proposal um, on April the 22nd. So th the, this whole thing, it's, it's, it, it, we're, we're starting to uncover things, but what we're starting to uncover is that we had a absolute hand in drafting that, and they could not have done that just at the behest of the bureaucrats. So the question now is, is on April the 16th, who in Trudeau's government did we, did Mark and Craig Kielberger give their initial proposal to? So uh, Ms. Warnick did talk a little bit about that, and I had to stop watching. I just want to preface these comments by saying I had to stop watching 10 minutes before the show started at 4.50, so I don't, and she did continue testifying, so she may have said something after that. But what I remember her saying before was, Emily, that uh, among those ministers who received this was Minister Chagger, who I had on the show, and hence who I asked about this. She said herself she did not discuss the proposal with people in, this, in the prime. This is the initial proposal, which is different than the one that ended up as the program. But she didn't discuss it with people in the prime minister's office, but she, she could not say whether or not people in her office did. Yes, there's a lot of questions still on uh, what exactly has happened. Uh, I think the, 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 the hearing today just leaves a lot of us with even more questions that we had uh, before, before the hearing started. So uh, as uh, David and Jenny were saying, uh, it's, the government had a version of the story where uh, it was very much, uh, you know, the public service proposed this and then the government responded. Uh, but, but now we're saying that it's a little bit more of a chicken and the egg kind of a situation where it's hard, it's hard to, um, to know how exactly things have started. So, uh, uh, I guess uh, we'll have a lot more of of, uh, of questions and a lot of things to to still know uh, more about in the in the coming days. What do you think the government could say, or what information, David, could the government put out there that would put it to bed for them? Uh, well, I, I think uh, clear evidence of uh, clear evidence of a ministerial recommendation. Um, uh, and uh, some clarity on the timelines. I think they've got to tight. I think they've got to tighten up the story. You know, I think it's important. As somebody who has once appeared before a parliamentary committee, <laughs> I can tell you that not everything that's said there is true, and there's not what? a lot. And there's not a lot of context. Uh, not a lot of context for what goes on there. So not everything that looks nefarious is nefarious. For example, if the if the minister's office spoke with the prime minister's office about this program before it went to cabinet, there's nothing nefarious about that. The minister's offices and the PMO work together all the time. So it could be nefarious, but it isn't necessarily nefarious. And I think that That's fair. we shouldn't judge uh, we shouldn't judge this issue on on uh, one day of parliamentary committee. I think there's probably a little bit more reflective environments in which the full context can come out. Well, uh, there's another committee tomorrow, which I'm guessing that you probably don't think will be too reflective or, or provide that additional context either. Uh, Jenny, what what do you think? Sorry, is, I, is, I just want to be clear. I'm not blaming the committees. No, no, no. I'm not either. Good job today. I'm not. Right. But no. it's 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 a it's a political forum. I, I guess where, where what is the context, Jenny? Do you think there is a, a context in which the government could put that information out there, qualify, well, you know, what those discussions were about and and uh, put those concerns to rest? Or is it beyond that? 
Well, no, see, I just want to say to David's point where this is a political form, it actually isn't. The only political person that testified was the minister. And for all the heavy lifting, the government stuck out public servants uh, to actually try to defend uh, their government's decision on this horrible, uh, horrible program. Uh, I think that if what the Liberals need to do is what I said for the last two weeks, this isn't a, a new thing, uh, is that they should release all the documentation. Uh, everyone showed up to, to committee today and there was, no, uh, there was no documentation that were given to committee members that showed there was a recommendation and writing from the bureaucrats to uh, to uh, to the government that we was the only one uh, that could handle this program. Uh, another thing that was interesting is when pressed, uh, Rachel Wernick uh, was asked about uh, whether she was uh, whether. Uh, the we what other organizations were considered uh, uh, to deliver this program as well, and she said consider, considered. She was pressed on, did you speak to other organizations? And she went back to considered. So this genuinely was uh, no other organization. It seems it seems was in any way considered uh, by the uh, by the government. Do you think, Emily, there there's something that could come out, or there is an amount of information or a type of information that could come out that would diffuse this uh, controversy or diffuse some of the criticism the government's getting? I think most of the diffusal that could happen uh, has happened when uh, they decided to cut the contract, basically, or uh, you know, when 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 it, the, it was decided that the program would not be taking place. Um, uh, there's still going to be a lot of questions and there's still going to be a lot of uh, inquiry into what exactly has happened. Uh, but at the same time, it feels a little bit like something that the general public might not be following too closely in some ways. We are in the middle of July in a pandemic uh, where, uh, you know, uh, so with, with, a, with a scandal that uh, basically is about a contract that was already cancelled. And so, yes, there's going to be a lot of things, but I think that a lot of questions staying and I think it's very important to have those conversations about ethics, but at the same time, it does feel like a story that could uh, draw, just, you know, make a lot of people write and talk about in the Ottawa bubble, but that few people outside of that bubble might follow. And so we'll see uh, in terms of, you know, diffusing it within the Ottawa bubble, I think it's going to take a while, but in terms of, uh, you know, what the impact it's going to have on the, the Canadian uh, opinion of the Trudeau government, I'm very curious actually to see whether or not people are going to be uh, in this summer of 2020 very uh, enthusiastic about following what the, the details of, of the parliament hearings. Yeah, that's always an interesting conversation, David, around stories like this. I mean, I, I remember I'm on the receiving end of it for SNC and this, you know, you're making something out of nothing. Nobody outside of your show cares about it. Uh, and I'm sure there's there's truth to that. But at the same time, we've seen, for example, Angus Reid did some polling. And it, I don't think it necessarily draws liberal supporters away from the prime minister and, and maybe not this instance specifically, but add it to the others. And it certainly heightens the desire of those who would normally support the conservatives or NDP not to move over to the liberals or not specifically to support the prime minister. So it's a I mean, it's a it's a moving target. I'm not sure how much it resonates that you never know. Uh, but what do you what do you think about that? Uh, I haven't seen any data either that's convincing one way or another. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the, uh, the political parties, are, including the government, are acting like it matters. So I assume that it does matter in their data that it's showing up uh, as relevant. And, you know, I think that there's, there's the summer issue. There's also the fact that the pandemic is still on and people may or may not be that interested in politics per se. But I still think this is the kind of thing that, can break through, and I think that the government is is appropriately nervous about it. Um, I don't think they've lost this fight yet at all, especially as you say with their own supporters. But it's not going well. And if the next week on this is as bad as this week on it was, somebody in the government should not be buying green bananas. <laughs> Jenny, what do you think on that question about the resonance of the story? I think this is resonating. Unlike SNC-Lavalin, this one's easy for people to understand. Uh, you have a government whose prime minister and minister of finance Finance's family have fin financial connections either through contracts or through uh, a job with the WE organization. And this was a contract. Now we're finding out more. This was this was a 
one billion dollar program to administer that we was going to get 22 billion dollars for we find out today it's actually 44 billion dollars million million uh, million for 43.5 million, million dollars sorry sorry yeah 40, 44 million dollars um <laughs> uh to uh, uh to administer and i think what's actually dr going to drive the story as well is you've got this other uh, story brewing uh, actually about we and their internal finances and and, and their real estate holdings. They're a, they're a charity that owns at least $50 million in real estate assets. So I think that although that is a separate story, they're all intertwined. And I think that that is going to drive it even more into the public's, uh, into the public's, uh, in front of the public. I just want to get one, and I mean, I should say that we released a statement yesterday talking about re-examining its corporate structure, its governance, a whole host of things, as well as kind of canceling We Days, which is what they're really known for among a lot of youth in this country, and focusing on international development. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.